Pharisees. This was art about people in their communities with a little A and not art with a big A, right? In fact, neither in Greek nor in Latin nor in Aramaic or in Hebrew was there any word for an artist until the Renaissance. And even then, Hebrew didn't have one until the 1920s, which is really an interesting point. Now, my point with all of this is we're dealing with stuff that people created for the lives of their communities and how their communities functioned within very specific context and very specific worlds. And being people of the Roman Empire, which are the people that we deal with, meaning they've been dead for at least 1,500 years, dealing with people of the Roman Empire, um, we find that there are things that they have in common that they don't even know they have in common, and ways of thinking that they don't even know they, they share. And, and very often you can uncover those by doing the parallel work and then doing the comparison. And, and so that's what we're going to share with you. Now, my job today is to speak about the temple in Jerusalem. Now, the problem is I just taught two semesters on the temple in Jerusalem, um, starting with the return from Babylonia and it's the beginning of Reconstruction in 520 BCE through the destruction of the temple in the year 70 under Vespasian by his son Titus, continuing up until, oh, about yesterday. <laughs> and we at Chief University did a conference on the temple um, just a few years ago called the Temple of Jerusalem from Moses to the Messiah. And so this is a very complex problem. And so what I decided to do is to share some of the art historical connections and deal with some of the present past relationships in the attempt to reconstruct some of these connections. Okay? After I've done that, I'm going to focus on the building of the temple itself um, by Herod the Great in, 50, in 20 to 15 BCE, before the Christian era. Um, we're going to go to the life of the temple after the temple was destroyed, meaning in the first centuries of the Christian era and see how imagery and mem memory come together in the construction of sacred space made in the synagogue um, in the third, fourth, fifth centuries. All of that in 20 minutes, <laughs> okay? So bear with me, I've already used three. Now, is this gonna go? Yeah, this is the space we're talking about. If you haven't been there, there are advertisements in your local New York Times this weekend. Come to Israel, stay with friends. Um, the Temple Mount, um, in Jerusalem, everybody knows the Western Wall, the excavations off to the right, conducted by Mazar in the 70s. This is mouse work. Yeah, there it is. There it is. All right. Construct, uh, the Dome of the Rock at the point where the temple stood um, up again until the year 70. These huge retaining walls built by Herod the Great in his magnificent reconstruction of Jerusalem. Now, this is a drawing that was done by Benjamin and the Mazar's team as part of their excavations. Uh, in the 60s and early 70s. This is quite an impressive place, and, and we know a lot about it, but only some of that is archaeological. We know about it from ancient writings like the book of Ecclesiasticus of the Apocrypha, where uh, Joshua, son of Sirach, tells you all sorts of things about both the buildings, the construction of the buildings, and the um, High priest and his service within the temple, Philo of Alexandria and his descriptions of the um, various visits that people made the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Roman authors like Tacitus would tell you how really amazing the city was before it was destroyed, and rightly so. Josephus, the great Jewish historian whose works were preserved by the church, who describes the temple of Jerusalem not once but twice. Once in his book, The Jewish War, which was completed somewhere around 80, and again around 90 in his book, Antiquities of the Jews. And in each of these books, he gives a slightly different description with slightly different focus, which has driven folks who love details and love to make all the details fit together absolutely crazy. Because, of course, Mr. Josephus was not a architectural historian. He brought out the themes that were important to him. Um, and so we have Josephus giving a lot of information, but it's not always clear what to do with it. Next, New Testament literature, meaning both the Gospels and um, some of the apocryphal New Testament sources, some of the papyri found in Egypt, that describe um, Jesus in the temple, especially in the Gospel according to Luke and many other places. Um, 
rabbinic literature, the rabbis speak endlessly about the temple, beginning at the earliest phase, describing the sacrifices, discussing the sacrifices, discussing the buildings. And one of my favorite descriptions is how the Levite was sitting and doing his job in the temple and his priestly watch as he's supposed to do twice a year and he fell asleep and they caught him and they burned up his clothes and he was not a happy fellow. But we have all sorts of information within the temple of the temple in rabbinic literature. Now the problem is that rabbis were not antiquarians and they were not to impress Romans. And so the sources that they provide give all sorts of good facts but very often their facts are colored toward a messianic temple that would be rebuilt rather than toward the archaeological building that stood there. Hence, for example, where the Book of Ezekiel and the Temple Scroll among the Dead Sea Scrolls describes a square temple mount. Everybody knows that Herod's temple mount was rectangular. You saw it, right? Now, if Herod is rectangular, but the ideal temple is square, guess what? When the rabbis describe the temple, it's a square, because the question is not what was, but what will be, because the assumption was and continues to be that it will be built at any moment. Now, when you were closer to the year 70, that any moment seemed to be a little closer, because after all, it had been rebuilt 70 years later, the first time after the destruction of the temple by the, by the Babylonians, it must be that 70 years later it's gonna come back. And then as the decades slipped and as time went on, distance developed in that sense of longing and memory and construction, hence, of memory over a very, very long period. And finally, the archaeological material, some of which we'll look at in the next little while. We have a lot. Some of it's just been standing there for 2,000 years. Some of it's been excavated. And some of it is just plain guesswork by archaeologists who compare all those sources with all of their complexity to the very scant archaeological sources that have been recovered, partially because of the politics of the Mideast and some of the capacity to excavate in that part of the world, with other buildings in the Roman world. So let's begin with what most of us think we know. Here you see the Temple of Jerusalem at the Israel Museum. It used to be at the Holy Land Hotel in Jerusalem, constructed in the early 60s by Michael Aviona, the great historical geographer of the Hebrew University. This is the iconic image of the temple, after all. When the rabbi said, who has never seen the Temple of Herod, has never seen a beautiful building, um, they were probably within range of what was correct. Romans as well said that Jerusalem was the most beautiful city of the East as reconstructed by Herod, and recent scholarship has even suggested that the ground of Jerusalem from the first century was polluted with silver and gold, which tells you a lot about how much richness there was in this place at that moment with Jews sending money from all over the Roman Empire. But what you see before you is a Roman temple. There's nothing there that looks particularly Jewish. The only thing that could look particularly Jewish is what's not there. There ain't no statues of gods, no statues of emperors, right? It's the not rather than the is. Um, my general terminology for all of this is that Jews are the same as everyone else until they're not. And in this case, it's imagery that they consider to be, uh, that considered to be um, idolatrous, that's not, okay? And so here you see the temple. It's the one that everybody knows. It's the one that Aviona made up. Here you see the one that Aviona made up, put into computer-generated form that you can go visit on the site. And they tell you on the archaeological site of the, uh, the, uh, the website of the uh, Temple Mount Digs that they followed Aviona because it's conventional. What they don't tell you is they follow Aviona because everybody loves Aviona's model. It shows up on t-shirts, it shows up on piggy banks, it shows up on drawings by his own daughter who became fervently orthodox and has the shin of God's name in the sky. Everybody knows that Aviona's model is what the temple would look like because after all, Aviona made it up, okay? Before that, when Jews imagined the temple, there were all sorts of possibilities, including even the image of the Dome of the Rock in medieval Jewish stuff that continued into the 19th and 20th century. 
Now, here you see the model again as it is at the Israel Museum. It's been polished up. It's really very nice. But notice the tetra stele, the four columns on the facade. Notice all the gold. Um, Josephus says that the facade of the temple was covered with gold, so you won't be surprised if one of the models that was created by Lee Rittmeyer has gold sheeting. But he only mentions it once, and in the other place it's made of shiny stone. So since in one place it's made of gold, and the other place it's made of shiny stone, Mr. Ambiona had to make a choice, right? This is a model, this is not a scholarly paper. And so he chose to make what probably was the more rational decision and not cover it with gold. But notice he even has the gates of Nicanor, whose doors are known to be made of famous Corinthian gold. Um, Nicanor, because a Jew from Alexandria donated it, there's lots of stories to go around his donation, and folks thought it was a myth until on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem they found the tomb, and in the tomb was a box, and inside the box it said, the tomb of the sons of Nicanor, who gave the gates. Not bad. Now, our model, where does it come from? One place it comes from is the coins of the Second Jewish Revolt of 132 to 135, folks who you might assume might have some memory of the temple. Notice a couple of interesting things about this model. Number one, the four columns. You remember Aviona put the same four columns. Number two, inside the doors is the table of the showbread, or the bread of presents, or the shulchan lechem apanim, whatever you want to call it. And before the temple is a fence enclosing the entire temple area. Now, there are those that want to say that there is a garland on top of some of these, not this particular coin. Is this thing working? Come on, Mousy. Oh, that's working. Now, it's another edge of the temple from around the year, uh, from exactly the year, 245-6, discovered at Dororopos in Syria in the synagogue, which we'll look at in a few more moments. Notice our temple looks a lot like the temple that we saw before, except that the tympanum here parallels the conch shell below under which the Torah scrolls would have been kept. And so there's a clear relationship between the image of the temple and the image of the synagogue. I don't want to go into the imagery on the sides right now, but we'll come back to the main. Okay? Where else did he get his models from? Here you see the temple of Baal Shamin in Palmyra. Remember Baal? That fellow that Eliyahu, Elijah had so much trouble with on Mount Carmel? He didn't just disappear because Elijah beat them. Okay? In fact, they continue in uh, Phoenicia and the Punic territories all over uh, North Africa, into Spain, uh, into modern, into, into late antique times. Uh, this is in Palmyra. Notice the temple of our friend Baal. And this is one of the models that Aviona used explicitly. Hence, if you take a look at the bottom right, you will see the uh, the columns against the side of the wall. Notice the facade here. So he was looking out through the Roman world to create a Roman temple. There's a lot of sense to that because Herod the Great was intentionally being a good vassal to his supporter, his niche, Augustus. And as Augustus was building Rome, rebuilding Rome, making Rome the imperial city, Herod was making Judea his kingdom building here, building a polytheistic temple to the emperor in, um, in Sebastia, in modern Nablus, building another temple to Roma in Caesarea Maritima, another one in uh, Omrit, up in the north near Banyas, uh, Caesarea Philippi, and then continuing outside of Palestine. And so Herod was an equal opportunity builder of temples. When he was among Jews, he built temples for Jews without images. When he was with non-Jews, he built temples for non-Jews with it.